Well, I like house calls. I hope you guys like house calls. I'm here in uh, Ocala, Florida today, and we have a Zenith builder that I've been following for some time, Michael Hildebrand, to give us a quick tour of his cruiser. Hi there, I'm Michael Hildebrand. I'm here in Ocala, Florida, and this is uh, my Zenith 750 Cruiser aircraft, and uh, I'm using a Viking 130 engine on this aircraft. And uh, I've been working on this for about a, a year and uh, six months right now. All right, Michael, so and this is not your, your first attempt at building an aircraft. You, you're kind of a repeat offender in the aviation world. What else have you worked on in your, your past history? Sure, uh, I've built a, uh, or assembled a Quad City Challenger, kind of an ultralight aircraft, but uh, this hit two people. It was a fun build, uh, tube and fabric type job. Uh, also, the Sonex aircraft, uh, that was a 6061T6 aluminum, just like this one here, and a primarily pop rivet type style aircraft as well. My dad and I uh, put those two aircraft together, and uh, good time doing that. All right, so with many kits, especially the Zenith, there's, uh, you can kind of start anywhere. So how did you progress through the different uh, sub-assemblies on your build? Sure. Um, I got the, uh, started with the empennage kit or the uh, horizontal uh, horizontal stabilizer or rudder assembly, uh, kind of that pathway. Went from there onto the wings. Once I finished the wings, then I went ahead and ordered the uh, got the fuselage kit at that point in time, and uh, that's kind of been my progression. Um, right now, I'm kind of working on still a little bit more extra wiring and uh, connecting some parts to my engine at this point. And through that process, what has been the most challenging and then the most fun of the build process? <laughs> Honestly, uh, wiring for both answers actually. <laughs> the wiring is actually a lot of fun, but at the same time it's, it's, it's pretty challenging. Uh, you're pretty much left up on your own as far as the wiring because there's uh, such a variety of uh, uh, installation options you have uh, for different vendors, whether Garmin, Dynon, or I'm using Grand Rapids Technologies. And uh, the wiring is just all a little slightly different. So it's fun to uh, look into the wiring process and at the same time it's challenging as, as well. So you've built several aircraft in the past. Uh, what made you really consider the Zenith as your, your third build and what else did you compare it to maybe? Ooh, uh, good question. Uh, I wanted this aircraft uh, just to, uh, I'm living in the Florida area now from Wichita, Kansas, and it's such an awesome scenery here in Florida with the uh, Gulf and the different oceans and just everything you can look at. So I like the visibility of the Zenith aircraft and uh, just to go low and slow. Uh, I learned life is, goes by pretty quickly actually, so maybe this will help remind me that to maybe slow things down in life a little bit and just you know take my time doing stuff and uh, just enjoy the scenery, I guess, you know? And uh, this airplane with the bubble canopies and the visibility is just truly remarkable from almost any other aircraft I've been in. It, comparable to a helicopter almost. So. Since we're at the front of the airplane here, let's talk about the engine. You, you chose the Viking and what made you choose that and what other considerations did you have before uh, pulling the trigger on that? Uh, the Viking engine, uh, good question as well because uh, I've had uh, other engines for this airplane uh, considera considering a Jabru. I've flown in a Jabru on my Sonics. I absolutely love that engine. Um, flown with Rotex on my Quad City Challenger and uh, that engine was okay. And uh, as far as the Viking engine, I've always been interested in the newer technologies. And uh, um, I had a Cherokee 180 Lycoming, and I know they're great engines. They say they're bulletproof, but I just had all kinds of issues with mine and my Cherokee 180. So I just want something more modern. I, I played with the old uh, Lycoming I had as a 1963 model, but um, this Viking, I just love the idea of the new technology out there. and. Uh, the, the cost was, was definitely a factor in the equation as well. And uh, more and more Viking aircraft, uh, I, I'm seeing them around on the internet and uh, people talking about them, the, uh, the praise that um, Jan and Alyssa give as far as their customer service is just something you don't really don't see in this industry, or <laughs> not really in this industry, but a lot of places you go to nowadays, um, you just feel like you're, uh, you're doing them a favor as opposed to you know uh, them doing you a favor type thing. So it, that was a big consideration. So getting the kit from them, uh -huh. um, how challenging was it to get it mounted on your airframe? Oh, that part was surprisingly easy. Uh, this is probably, out of the three aircraft, this is probably the easiest one to mount. Uh, it came with this uh, uh, engine mount from uh, Viking, and uh, I had them powder coated it, this green color, I love it, and uh, it was pretty much a plug and play. It truly was a plug and play. I was, I was shocked. Uh, this went on, it already matched up the holes that were pre-existing the firewall from Zenith and uh, 
the holes from the uh, accepting the uh, engine to the engine mount, pretty much just plug and play. I had a shimmy just a little bit uh, with my wife and my kids kind of helped out. Took maybe all of 12 minutes. <laughs> it was really, really quick. So uh, that was a fun process the, to see that accomplishment in such a little time. So that's the engine mount and there, of course there's the, the coolant and then the, the fuel, the header tank, did you install all that yourself as well? Um, yeah, absolutely. The header tank is in back of the fuselage. I did that when I was building the fuselage. I, I put the header tank in. So I got that before I got the engine actually. Um, running the, yeah, the fuel line was not a big deal at all. Um, he has lots of videos online showing how to do that. So I just, I copied that and what other people have done in the past. It seems to work for them. And uh, comes up the firewall, that part was not an issue. Uh, fuel pressure just, or the fuel uh, hose goes right up here from the bottom of the uh, uh, aircraft. And as far as the coolant system, uh, yeah, again, his videos were spot on. Uh, he gives you all the pipe, tubing, plumbing. You just connect it just like he shows and uh, it just works, it just fit. We are partnering with great companies like Dynon Avionics at Dynon.com, AirTech Coatings at AirTechCoatings.com, Aviation Youth Magazine at AviationUSA.com. The Aviators Clinic at aviatorsclinic.com. Take a moment to go visit their websites at the links found below in the description of this video. And visit our website at experimentalaircraftchannel.com for events, our video library arranged in easy to find playlists on specific topics, affiliate products, aviation merchandise, and so much more. So looking around the interior of your airplane, you've got quite a few new holes that aren't factory. Yes. You want to explain the, uh, the access holes and where they came from? Um, yeah, I didn't originally have them in there, and that's not something that's typically part of the uh, Zenith plans. Um, I got these from, uh, I think it's aircraft, uh, experimental aircraft accessories. Uh, these kits uh, come already uh, CNC uh, uh, machined, and uh, I put these in here because I have autopilot system back in here, I have access to wiring, and I think it would be a good idea to, uh, to install these access panels uh, in here. Uh, I was afraid to rivet this part down, actually. So uh, once I said, hey, I'm just gonna put some access panels down here, so then I wasn't afraid anymore. <laughs> so at least I have access to, to get in here in case I need to for wiring and uh, to work on the autopilot system and even some of my fuel lines are running through here as well, so. Uh, so I understand uh, Michael Chesney, who is the owner of that company, and he has, several different ones, uh, including side panel, which I see you've got there. Uh, yeah, um, I decided to put this one in here and uh, mainly so I can get, have access to my uh, header tank back here for the Viking engine. Uh, it goes along this, it mounts over here to this upright and uh, this gives me great access. There is access a uh, hole down at the bottom here, but uh, it's really hard for somebody my size to get into that. So uh, this access panel, I can actually do a nice visual inspection in here. Uh, look at the header tank, change fuel tubing, look at a lot of other inspection type items uh, through this access panel. And it closes really nice like that. It comes with the latches, everything already ready to be mounted. So uh, pretty, pl pretty much plug and play as well. Walking up to Michael's plane, you cannot ignore his color <laughs> on his instrument panel. I think he's done a nice job in doing some uh, vibrant green against the black. And you can see in the light here, kind of go back and forth the uh, carbon fiber look he's got going on. So what do you have? Talk to us about, about your instrument panel. Okay, um, I elected to go with the Grand Rapids technology and uh, I'm using their engine information system uh, for the basic engine monitoring. This also has airspeed, uh, altitude uh, capabilities as well. And uh, that's an option you can get from them. And this will talk to the GRT. This is a touch screen. Uh, also works as the interface for the uh, transponder. So I can uh, have a remotely mounted transponder underneath that seat over there, along with the antenna. And uh, so I'll adjust, uh, this will show me airspeed, indicator, attitude, the whole nine yards. Also works the autopilot and like I said, the transponder function with the GRT. And this will graphically display this information up on here as well. Throttle, USB ports down here, one over here, one over there. Push to talk right here for the pilot. Push to talk for the passenger, another USB port. And uh, articulating mount for my uh, iPad. Uh, I can display uh, uh, one of my uh, four flights or some other program on here. 
All right, so one of the things I wanted Michael to showcase here is he's got kind of a unique situation with the uh, seat installation. And I saw this posted on social months ago, and I was kind of hemming and hawing about my option of the slider seat or this. Explain what you did here. <laughs> sure, and this isn't my design. Somebody else came up with this. I just happened to copy them. And uh, I, to me, it seemed like a genius idea. And uh, what we're doing is just using hinges. One side of a hinge down here on the seat, and the other side of the hinge over here on this part. So what you can do is actually just place your seat wherever you want it in between the hinges and uh, it fits on there. Then you just slide your pins into here and one into here and you can adjust it forward and aft as you need to. And uh, I think that's to be a nice lightweight solution, I hope, and uh, we'll see. That's awesome. It's, nice. it's, it's like completely, absolutely simple and weighs nothing. Yeah, exactly, and I thought I thought the same thing. All right, so Michael and I are both uh, Zenith Cruiser builders, and we both opted to go with some uh, bigger additions. You want to talk about the why to uh, changing up from the Cruiser uh, wheels and suspension? Yes, uh, absolutely. The uh, the bigger wheels on here, they're the stall wheels. Um, I like to go to pancake fly-ins. I like to eat. Um, <laughs> I go pancake, hot dog, hamburger fly-ins. A lot of these are at community airports that have grass runways. So uh, sometimes those grass runways I've historically found have potholes and that type of thing in them. So I got the bigger wheels, so hopefully they can handle those potholes maybe a little bit easier. So uh, that's why I went, opted for the bigger wheels, and I'm not here to go fast and put wheel fairings or anything on, so uh, this works for me. So you've made a lot of progress. I've been kind of following you on social. I kind of stalk people as they're building. It's a, it's just a thing I do. Um, but what is your, I'm not going to hold you to this, uh -huh. but what is your estimated completion date? Uh, well, first off, when should this move to the hangar and then when will your completion date be? Sure. I, uh, I talked with Wills of Herman at Wills and, Wills and Winks and uh, talked with him about helping me put the wings on. So I'm going to get some assistance from him and uh, we plan on meeting up maybe the first or second week of August. Uh, it, I'm going to probably take the plane uh, out to the hangar mid-July, put the horizontal stabilizer on it so that will be on so we can help uh, help assist in rigging the wings with that with that portion on the airplane already. So uh, uh, wings on uh, by, by August and uh, a couple odds and ends to tidy up, airworthiness inspection, and I'm hoping no later than December. I think that's a reasonable goal at this point, so uh, to so, get in the air. So 2022 is the goal. 2022 is the goal, yes. Well, I, I hope that you can get there and uh, have to come back and see this thing finished. Absolutely, absolutely.